Ladies and gentlemen, according to Forbes, so you don't, you don't know if you can trust that information or not, but according to Forbes, we have the youngest billionaire in Africa sitting right next to me, and he's been that way for eight years. So we're waiting for somebody to take him down, guys. We want some younger African billionaires, but until then, you got the king right here. Moduji is here. In the video clips, I'm about to show you the youngest billionaire in Africa, Mo DG, but if I pronounce that name correctly, was interviewed by Forbes and he was asked, what was your secret? How did you make it to return from America, coming to a poor country and you make 1.5 billion dollars? And this guy gave three very, very good advice that I think we benefit somebody so i decided to make this video all about that so let's listen to him together when i graduated and uh, i had two choices either to remain in the u.s or to come back to africa now africa was very challenging because at that time when you look at tanzania the per capita income uh, was 300 350 dollars so i'm like how am i going to become a billionaire in an economy where people do not have much money. Uh, so I said, let me start following the money. That, fine, it's 300 bucks or 400 bucks. Where do they spend that money? So I went in uh, and created, my father was a, a trade, he was running a trade house doing soft commodities. So I continued increasing the trading commodity business. So I do sugar, rice, fertilizer, everything from bubble gum to yeast from tractors to motorcycles. And, but then I felt that there was a need of value addition and manufacturing. Uh, while my father imported edible oils, I went into uh, investment into edible oil refining, soap manufacturing, cooking fats, margarines. At that time, Unilever and Procter & Gamble were very big. So we competed with them and we've cornered them with homegrown brands. I got into textiles. I was always wondering that why Tanzania has cotton or Africa has cotton, but we are importing clothing from China. So I said, okay, what are the main ingredients uh, to run a successful textile business? A, you need to have cotton. Many countries have cotton in Africa, Zambia, Mozambique, Tanzania. Two, relatively competitive labor. Tanzania today is $100, $150. Three, power. Tanzania is nine cents, China is nine cents, uh, India is nine cents, and technology is, is, is capital. So I invested. So now I do ginning, spinning, weaving, processing, mercerizing, dyeing, knitting, printing, and garmenting. <laughs> but the best part about this is that while I'm doing all this, I'm employing 4,000 people. And so this is a big impact. And, and trust me, now we're producing over 100 million meters of cloth, which is 100,000 kilometers of cloth. So I could wrap the world twice with the, with the cloth that we produce. So slowly, 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 I got into... A, I got into plastics. I said, look, Coke is there, Pepsi is there. I need to create, so, so you know in the US, my name is Mohammed, they call me Mo, so I went with Mo Cola and Mo Extra. And today we're selling over a billion bottles uh, of uh, carbonated soft drinks. And I'm into water, into juices, into carbonated drinks, but everything from PET, HDP, LDP, and so on and so forth. But how do you, but how do you again, how do you make that limp, link? I mean, you're sitting here, tech sales, and, 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 and you go, you know, and you vertically integrate to jump then to soft drinks. Like, what, what was that mindset? What were you looking for? So I, I was looking at uh, Your Excellency. Um, at that time, I realized, you know, Coke and Pepsi, I could outprice them. Uh, so I said to create a, 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 a B type of a cola and to be competitive. So what I do is if they sell 300 milliliters, I sell 350 milliliters and I give them a slight discount. And the quality of the product is good, the taste is good, so I become competitive and I can sell. Uh, so similarly... So give, give the customer a little more for a little less. And, 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 and that's, that's a value pretty money. simple formula, that's yeah. good. Um, and then slowly, slowly, so we got into, so I have maybe 40 different types of manufacturing industries, uh, Eastern Central Africa. And then I went into agriculture. 
and I invested in, if you guys know what sisal is, sisal is a natural fiber predominantly was used in the shipping industry for ropes and twines. But then it got into the elevator cords, it got into the building industry, uh, the car manufacturing industry, the dashboard and the sideboards. So today I am the world's largest sisal producer from Tanzania. Then we do tea, we have tea gardens, we do tea, we export to Europe, uh, we are also into cashew nuts, so we process cashews into cashew kernels and export the kernels to the United States. So value addition, jobs, competitive advantage, but the challenge was capital. Because at that time, I remember when I got back, a Barclays bank could only lend me $2 million because the paid up capital was $10 million. So I'm like, okay, how am I going to grow to become a multi-billion dollar company if I do not have capital? So I slowly, slowly started going to South Africa. The financial markets are more complex there and started borrowing money, etc., etc. Now that relationship is gone into uh, uh, no, uh, north of a quarter of a billion dollars that they lend me and very competitively. So, so that, that also played a big role in my growth. Uh, but generally, what I'm proud the most is that now uh, the conglomerate uh, employs 38,000 people. Mm. You probably don't put list on what this guy said. So let me help you to summarize the three most important things, as according to me, uh, that he said. And the number one is. When he finished his education in the United States, he returned to Africa. Right now I'm 47, uh, so I graduated uh, from university and went straight to Tanzania and started the business. If you have been following my channel for a period of time, you will know that about me, that I'm kind of anti-migration. I don't know, maybe there's any word like that. Yes. Generally, I am not a fan of, you know, people running away from their countries in the name of money to other people's country. And I have been this way since I was 17 years. I remember one of my stepbrothers then wanted to help me to process visa to the United States. And I looked at his face and told him, I am not leaving Nigeria. And I was, I was just, was I 18 years? So, since when I was very young, I have had this disdain for the idea of I want to go and make money in the US. I want to go and make, because I just believe that there is no money in the US. There is no money in the UK. There is no money in China. You gotta be kidding me. There is money in your head. That's weird. Yeah. That's suspicious. If you have the head that can make money, you make the money anywhere. If you don't have the head, you don't make money. Yeah, many people are homeless in America. It doesn't matter. Because I refused to leave my country, I was able to figure out how to build my first successful company in Nigeria in 2016. You know, one of the joy you have when you build a business is that now you can hire other people and give them jobs. But if you run away from your country, you are going there to look for a job. It's like you are going to take instead of give. Now, I need you to listen to what this guy said here. Generally, what I'm proud the most is that now uh, the conglomerate uh, employs 38,000 people. The 38,000 people that this guy hired are 38,000 people that will have been unemployed today. Think about that for a moment. If you think I am advocating that you should stay in your country because I want you to employ other people, that is not the point. The point is there are probably more opportunities in your country, in Africa, right now, than in the US you are going to. Nah. Nah. I don't believe it. Most people are just not trained to see it because we are always made to believe that grass is greener at the other side. You know, I love to tell people in my private life this story. And that is the very first business that changed my life, which, by the way, was the very first time I was able to make real money. 
would not have been possible if I lived in the US. The only reason why I was able to get this opportunity to build, by the way, it was an agri technology company. I have told that story a million times on this channel, so let me don't let me bore you again with it. The only reason why it was possible was because I'm in Africa. If I was in the United States, I would have a job. That is what people do. Job. Now, if this guy was in the US, you think he will have the net worth of $1.4 billion? No! He will have a job. A job that pays him $80,000 a year, if he's lucky. The second advice, as I can see from this guy, is follow the money. When I graduated and uh, I had two choices, either to remain in the US or to come back to Africa. Now, Africa was very challenging because at that time, when you look at Tanzania, the per capita income uh, was $300, $350. So I'm like, how am I going to become a billionaire in an economy where people do not have much money. Uh, so I said, let me start following the money. One of the very common excuses Africans usually make is that, oh, there is no money in Africa. There is no money in Africa. Even if I stay in Africa, there is no way I can make money in Africa. Yeah, that is because many people in Africa are poor. But another way to look at it is this. Everybody in Africa is spending money. Yeah, maybe they are not spending it on the latest iPhone or the latest BMW car, but everybody in Africa, in some ways, are spending money. So if you want to build wealth, the very first question you should ask is, what are people spending money on? Again, uh, when I was building my first successful company, we were providing solution to a particular problem which was in our country's national conscience. So let me tell you the story. Uh, in 2014, Nigeria had a president, Goodluck Jonathan. This president was trying to renew people's interest in agriculture. So the government created different programs, enlightenment programs, you know, NGO, helping to finance some entrepreneurs that have interest in agriculture and stuff like that. Because of this government program, you have hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people who have renewed interest in agriculture. But these people have a problem. And that problem is most of them simply don't know anything about any agri business they want to start. And that was what I saw as an opportunity. I was like, oh, okay. Oh, we have a whole lot of people who are planning to start agri businesses. And these people, because they live in cities like Lagos, Abuja, Port Harcourt, or whatever, they have no idea how poultry, fishery, whatever works. Okay, what if I create that solution? Kind of like help these people to have connection with people, farmers, who already have experience. That was the simple concept my first company was built around. Again, I don't know how I would have been able to do anything similar to that if I had run to America. So what you want to ask yourself is, where do people spend their money? What are they interested in buying? What have they been buying? What problems do they have? And how can I come in? Anyway, I have a whole lot of videos on this channel, uh, which is about entrepreneurship. If you have interest, you can click into the home page and go and see those videos. Maybe they will help you in some way. The third advice I can hear from this guy is actually a particular phrase which he repeats again and again and that is slowly. Slowly, slowly, slowly. Yes, you will agree with me that this guy was fortunate in some way. He had a father, for example, who was a, an entrepreneur and that gave him some, you know, good start. Uh, but not everybody is going to have the same advantage. I did not have that. But regardless of 
What advantage you have? One very thing I have observed to be lacking among many Africans that I have interacted with is patience. You see, it is very, very difficult to build anything, especially business. I was broke. When I say broke, I mean not being able to feed yourself, not to talk of buying clothes for eight years in my entrepreneurial journey. During this eight years period, everybody that knew me was calling me to advise me. Go and get a job. Go back to school. Go and do something that other people are doing. Live a normal life. You know why they were giving me such advice? Well, because to them, I was wasting my life. Now, what most people in Africa don't understand, however, is that things take time. Like, things are built slowly. And if you want to build a successful company in Africa, you just have to understand that things are built slowly. Internet has destroyed a whole lot of people and one of the way internet destroy people is suddenly people think they can make money tomorrow morning because a lot of people who want to scam you will promise you that there is a way you can start making $10,000 every month next week but if truly you want to build wealth you have to understand this it happens slowly Again, the three advice I can extract from this guy's talk is number one, he came from the United States and returned to Africa. If anybody tells you that there is no money in Africa, it's because they are too dumb to understand how to make it. And I'm not trying to judge people who are running away from Africa. I am not judging you. I'm just telling you that, yeah we probably can make it in our country. Second advice from him is follow the money. Ask yourself, what are people spending money on? What will people be interested in spending money on? The third advice is do not forget, it happens slowly.